Hi guys, this episode today is dedicated to my own mother, a lovely woman, a great birthday present giver, and a huge supporter of the show. I mean, she listens, she doesn't, she's not sponsoring it or anything like that. Anyway, enjoy the show. Eiffel Tower with Oliver G. Eiffel Tower listeners, we're doing something way different this week. Uh, rather than me sitting by myself in the studio, I've asked Corey... Hello. Now famous from Corey Stories to come in from the start of the episode. Good to see you, Oliver. Good to see you too. Yeah. He doesn't know why we're here, and there's a reason that he doesn't know why we're here. It's because I like to put him on the spot, as you maybe heard before. Yeah, this is not the first time you've done this. Let's just, before we even get into what we're going to talk about, um, let's talk about the time when we met. So this is back, I don't know, was it last year? I don't know if it was last year. It was episode seven anyway. It was in one of those Turkish baths. We were both (laughs) nude. I said, Corey, come in. Uh, I didn't tell you anything about what the episode would be. But then uh, all I asked you was, are you confident that you know Paris well? Hmm. And you said something along the lines of, uh, yeah, let's go. I said something along the lines of, if you make me look like a fool on the radio, That's you're right. dead. And I said, I won't if you know Paris. And then I put you on the spot for 20 minutes. I said, every number of the arrondissements, the districts of Paris, you suggested something worth seeing, mm-hmm. like not the Eiffel Tower. Go and listen to episode seven if you haven't. Uh, I can reveal it's the most listened to episode that we've ever done. Is it? Yeah. Oh, that's great. So Fantastic. much so that I said, Corey, come back every episode for season two and give us a story. But this time... Uh, I wanted to have you in from the beginning while we talk over something really interesting. But I thought first, as a little lead-in, uh, I do... Sometimes we read out listener mail. Okay. Do you want to read one out? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, so read this one out nice and loud. Do a voice if you All want. All right, here we go. Go. Dear Oliver, loving the show, it really feels like the episodes are being made just for me. Maybe I'm just saying that because I'm your mother. <laughs> but nonetheless, keep up the good work. P.S. Don't forget it's... Gra- <laughs> It's grandma's birthday soon. So good reader. <laughs> good bit of reader or listener email oh, that's there. That's nice. From my mom. From your mom. But I thought actually I would mention my mom because uh, it's because of her that this episode came about. She doesn't even know I'm doing this either. But So she gave me a gift for my birthday okay. and it's a fantastic gift and I wanted to look over it with you based on your knowledge of Paris. Okay. So you got no idea what I got in this bag, but no. I'm going to get it out and for the next... Uh, The reason I put you on the spot as well, have you seen those videos on the internet when they have um, deaf people hearing for the first time? Oh, yeah. They're amazing Yeah, because it's their natural reaction. You couldn't go back to them afterwards and say, do that again. We want to record it. And that's why I wanted to have your natural reaction to this rather Mm. than... Okay. So You've piqued my interest. So this isn't how it was wrapped. I put it in a plastic bag. But I want to go over what's in this bag with you for for a minute. And I think that the the, the listeners are going to enjoy this. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. So this is what she gave me for my birthday. Have a look at this. What What's jumping out at you? Tell the, tell the listeners what you see first. I just see a, a sort of a small red book. It says Paris with some sort of emblem. Yep. Uh, an illustrated guidebook, it says at the bottom. So that's exactly what it is. An illustrated guidebook to Paris mm. in English. Mm. You're, you're holding it and you're looking intrigued. You're thinking, mm-hmm. what have I just signed up for? Mm-hmm. She didn't tell me anything about it. So I started looking through it. This fascinating little book in English. And I was like, when is this from, right? Yeah. And then she sent me an email afterwards because there's no date on the inside. This is from 1911. No. So this is a guidebook to Paris, I think by English people, written for people coming to this city over 100 years ago. Oh, that's gorgeous. So you're going to love it what's inside. I haven't (laughs) read it because I wanted to do it with you. Okay. Okay. So the first, I mean, I'll let you look through it uh, and say what you're seeing. But the first thing that I wanted to read when we get to reading is the introduction about the clothes that you should wear and the cafes you should go to. Oh, fantastic. This is uh, over 100 years ago. Yeah. So this, so talk what you're seeing. I mean, you're, you're, you've gone into the beginning okay, of the yeah, adverts. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of in the... The ads are brilliant. The ads are ridiculous. The first one that catches my eye, I want an advertisement for something that says, Brands Meat Lozenges. Yeah. What the <laughs> hell is a meat lozenge? It's for lozenge. Tu- and the way it's written, you can just imagine, for tourists, athletes, and invalids. In, in, and invalids. 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 Yeah, invalids. Well, it's... And it says a meal in your vest pocket, in boxes. Wow. Right? So Fantastic. these it's almost like Bible pages like from from Oh absolutely. This right? is beautiful. This is an artifact. Right? So yeah. there there would have been a map there. Unfortunately there's not a map that's been taken out. Okay. There's a map on at the beginning. There's another map though further in. But mm. before I let you get your <laughs> There's this page right before the title page it says delightful steamer trips. Isn't so you can amazing? take this big steamer boat. I I assume what through I th- England? I think, I think it's for England because Yeah, that one's for England. Nice. But they I guess the ads are for English people. So I'm going to read to you the first, okay. uh, the introduction. Yep. 
and then uh, we'll look through it together for a bit. If you're up for that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. 1911. Page 10. Dress. The arrangements for a visit to Paris. Shall I read it in English, like a London voice? Uh, if you can do a British accent, go for it. London. London. No, can't. Okay, fair enough. The arrangements for a visit to Paris should be of the same nature exactly as those you would make for a few days' sojourn in an important city at home. It is a great mistake and evidence of the worst possible taste to get oneself up in tourist fashion, and we frequently deplore the unfortunate impression our compatriots convey to our elegant neighbors on the other side of the channel by promenading the boulevards or driving through the Champs-Élysées in costumes such as would be suitable for shooting on Scotch moors or exploring Central Africa. Damn. How about that? That's poetry. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's very condescending, but uh, poetic <laughs> nonetheless. Because basically, if you... I mean, that, that's a very specific image of how you should dress. The whole book is like this. Wow. So I was thinking I'd ask you, what... I mean, let's get to the contents and the illustrations. There's like a yeah. hundred illustrations. There. Oh, that's so I was thinking, if you want to flick through that, what would be the kind of thing that would catch your eye? Because what... I mean, a hundred years ago in Paris, what, what did, what's, uh, you know... What are the things that people are going to be seeing back then? Right. Well, I would assume that there are a lot of the major monuments that we see today. Obviously, they haven't changed. Look at this beautiful little fold-out map that what? shows us the Bois de Boulogne. Oh, so that's the, the now, park. Now, for those of you who don't know Paris very well, today the Bois de Boulogne has a bit of a dark side because you can go there in the evening and see a certain type of... Uh, lady, shall we say? The word you're looking for is prostitute, ah, isn't it? Ah, thank you. Thank you. We uh, can say that on this show. Uh, yeah, I didn't know what kind of... I thought this was a family show. Apparently it isn't. But uh, yeah, uh, the Bois de Boulogne, but probably back then it was a lot more tame. You were on a page that says Père Lachaise at the top of the cemetery. Yeah. Could have been a lot emptier back then, 100 years ago. If you think about that, I mean, Edith Piaf wouldn't have been there. That's right. Edith Piaf wouldn't have been there in 1911. Oscar Wilde would have been there. Jim Morrison definitely wasn't there. Cool, huh? Yeah, that's What does it cool. say? What did it, t- who did it tell you to visit in Père Lachaise? Uh, Père Lachaise. Let's see. Here we go. Um, this is, properly speaking, the cemetery uh, for the eastern part of Paris. What does it mean, properly speaking? <laughs> well, don't Brits always speak properly? Yeah, right? Yeah, so that should just be a given. Why do they have to mention it? So it's just some some history. Uh, Montmartre, uh, cemetery, Montparnasse, etc. Who Père Lachaise was. He was the royal confessor of Louis XIV. Yeah, so advancing up the principal avenue, we find among other graves of distinguished men, on the right, those of Arago the astronomer. Albert the composer, Ledru Le Le Rollin. Mm. I think that's a street. Boy, I can tell you, don't try to navigate Père Lachaise with this old <laughs> <laughs> guide. It, it will get you lost terribly. Yeah, it's just giving us an idea of uh, the walk through Père Lachaise. And then we've got Place de la Bastille, actually a photograph. Now think about this, the photographs here in 1911. Yeah. I mean, that's a, just a whole different technology. But look at it. Describe to him what you see. Uh, Place de la Bastille is super quiet. I mean, there are just horse-drawn carriages. There's not a car in Isn't sight. Not funny? I mean, the same exact, uh, whatever you call it, structure in the middle. Yeah, the column. Still of the a Bastille. huge roundabout. Yeah. But and people are walking all over it. It looks like gravel. I don't see cobblestones necessarily. And yeah, people are just, which is what they did. They tooled around in horse-drawn carriages and carts. By the way, speaking of that, do you know that... Uh, in the 19th century, you know, around the Arc de Triomphe, there's a, this is enormous uh, roundabout yeah. where the traffic, you have 12 avenues of traffic just yeah, dumping yeah. into it. Well, originally, you could go in either direction when you entered that. Oh, my goodness. And the reason is because there were no automobiles back then. Oh, right. That's, it'd be so slow. It'd be it'd so just slow. Like a big square. So you could go left or right and do whatever you pleased. So here we've got the Luxembourg Gardens, Place Vendôme. Yeah. all of, Oh, we've got itineraries. Like, this is per day. So... On your third day in Paris, they recommend you do... Wow, this is quite a list. Could Go you really that. do this in a day? Go on, give us a skim through. You could do Léal, the marketplace, which would have still been there. If you guys know any, anything about the history of central Paris, there used to be this beautiful outdoor market called Léal. And it's been since moved out of Paris because it was too big and too nasty, I guess. But back then, you could visit it. The, the central Al. this is all in one day. saint Eustache Church, Hôtel des Postes, I don't even know what that is. The Tour Saint-Jacques, Hôtel de Ville, Notre-Dame, Saint-Chapelle, Palais de Justice, La Conciergerie, Hôtel Cluny. And we're only halfway through. This is supposed to be a whole day's itinerary. <laughs> Pal- Palais des Termes, uh, the Luxembourg. How would they? They couldn't have done that a day because they didn't oh have Uber. God. 
or indeed uh, was the metro there? Nineteen, yeah, the metro was there. Uh, did they have like horse-drawn Ubers back then? <laughs> I mean, that could have worked. And we've got a nice little photo of the Luxembourg oh, Gardens. Man, it looks exactly the same. You know, the men are all wearing their hats, and the children are dressed up all nice. Wow, ladies with their parasols. How can we? We got to bring that back. What about? What do you think about you and I bringing back the top hat? I don't think we'd be able to pull it off. I don't dare to do it myself. No. But if I could get a small club of guys. No, you're never going to succeed. I want to show you the page that uh, that that caught my eye was the cafes. Anyone that listened to this show before oh, yeah, knows that I like a, a good cafe in Paris. Yeah. And uh, let's see if I can find it. meals in Paris. I'm you know, like, if any of these restaurants still exist, if any of the oh sure, oh a few of them must. Yeah. The cafes. I think. Uh, Remember, we talked in a previous episode about the first cafe in Paris, the Pococo. Yeah. I bet that's in there somewhere. You think? Oh, sure. Oh, I guess it was if Napoleon hey, was... Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about it now, they were talking about it then. Tea rooms, cafes. Okay, let me read to you. Oh, I like a good tea room. The cafe, however, this is in contrast to tea rooms, which I mm. didn't read just then, is the preeminently French institution. Can we still say that? Sure. Cafes are found in almost every street in Paris. Still true? Yeah. Many Frenchmen who have no club, I assume that means like... <laughs> Not a club oh, to yeah, batter someone ba- on the head back no. then. <laughs> right, yeah, like a big iron club. No, but yeah, back in the day, you had to be a member of a club. Right. But if you didn't have one, I guess you went out looking for one. So these guys who have no club spend their free time at these establishments where billiards, dominoes, cards, and other games are provided. Mm. Not anymore. Now, billiards, we got to bring that back. There's no room anymore. I'm telling you, Oliver, top hats and billiards. You're living in the past. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. Tea, coffee, and alcoholic drinks of all kinds are served, varying in price according to the quarter of Paris. That's still true. Oh, yeah. Prices for most drinks are from 30C to 1F. So I guess that's francs. It's a centime and a franc. Okay. Or a franc. A bit more expensive. In 100. Prices have inflated. Yeah, you know what? Uh, the conversion, if I'm not mistaken, is you can multiply those francs back in the day by about five, and you can get the modern day price today in euros. Did you just make that up? Really? No. So about I used that in a previous episode. I told you about the um, the value of selling the Eiffel Tower. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I right. used that same conversion. That's right. That's now, right. Some, one of the listeners might come out and say that I'm wrong about that, but that's what I have uh, found. Hey, it's good. It means they're emailing us. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me finish, though. This is cool. Yeah. It says uh, the, the price is up to one franc, and it's usual to give 10 centimes or 20 centimes to the garçon. Ah, it says the it garçon. in italics. A word that you don't want to use nowadays. No, but in, in 1911, cafes. that would have been the height of... Of fashion. To Honestly, me. that's using the word garçon back in 1911. That's how you showed your sophistication. Oh man! Yelling out that word just randomly on the street. Garçon, garçon. garçon. You're gonna love Mademoiselle. this. Mademoiselle. You're gonna yeah. love it, Corey. Yeah. Writing materials are to be had at all cafes, and some men write their entire correspondence at the table of a cafe. Verlaine, the great French poet, never wrote a poem anywhere else. Oh, nice. How do you like that? Uh, that sounds so classy. It's like we said in a previous episode. Um, it's kind of like the guys with the laptops today. You know, yeah, that's a little bit of an epidemic, and I myself am um, guilty of that sometimes. Where guys will go into these cafes in Paris, and you know, classically, you can traditionally buy one espresso, and yeah. you can sit there for hours. Yeah. Some people really abuse that privilege. I know, and there are even cafes now that actually have you pay for the time that you spend there rather than the yeah what you drink. Tom Clark from Katoom Cafe, mm. friend of the show, mm. uh, he banned them, banned laptops. Yeah, tell me what else you find in the book. I'm interested right, in your see. thoughts because I think. Your uh, insight into the city is a bit more interesting than mine, Corey. Uh, well, thank you for that. You got the knowledge. I'm just, this show, for anyone who's never listened to an episode before, thanks for listening. Uh, but let me tell you, the whole point of this show is figuring out France, especially Paris, with me, a clueless Australian who's wound, in, wound up here. Mm. And I get someone uh, every weekend to come and help me figure that out. And so this week, it's Corey Fry, who's usually the guy that finishes the episode. Absolutely, and I, I love finishing the episodes. I'm just looking at more photos again. We've got the Bois de Boulogne with the horse-drawn carriages. Look at that. Let's see I'm going to take some of these pictures of the book and put them on the site so people can uh, see what we're talking about. Now, we've got, this is interesting, 1911. It predates Shakespeare and Company, so the little paragraph about bookshops doesn't mention it. What does it say? It says, English books and periodicals and copies of this guidebook, ah, they're promoting their own book, <laughs> can be pro- procured, not found or purchased, procured. Yeah. Man, these guys are classy. These gents. At uh, Galignani's Library, which still exists on the Rue de Rivoli, W.H. Smith, which still exists on the Rue de Rivoli, a uh, place called Brentano's. Never heard of it. No, and Library Castiglione, which may sound Sounds exist, Italian. I'm not sure. The little thing about the, uh, oh, the arrondissement. You you love to talk about the oh, arrondissement of Paris. Yeah, yeah. So let's see 100 years ago how they were talking Remember about it. Remember when we did Aaron Don't Miss a Month? 
Yeah, that terrible pun. How could I forget? Yeah, I think we already talked about that in this episode. <laughs> Right now, that's how we started the episode. <laughs> All right, I thought it was a good pun. All right, here we go. Uh, the arrondissement, uh, as per the reader of 1911. Uh, for administrative purposes, Paris is divided into 20 parishes or arrondissements. Parishes. I thought it was, wasn't it like 10 in the old day? Oh, no, that was way well, back, right? Yeah, pre-1860. Ah, okay. There was a retooling of it. Um, of which 14 are on the north bank and six on the south. Still true, Corey. Is that true? Yeah. I didn't even know that. <laughs> um, as a knowledge of the arrangement of these arrondissements, though not indis- indispensable, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to read it in French, <laughs> indispensable, um, it's often useful. It may be mentioned that they form a kind of spiral, mm. right? Classic uh, escargot. People say show. snail nowadays. Yeah, snail. Come a long way. <laughs> the first four are grouped in a square on the north bank of the river in the center of the city. The 5th, 6th, and 7th, numbered from east to west, lie on the south bank. True. Yeah, and this is rather boring. It's just telling us where <laughs> they I think it's are. still interesting. Yeah. Uh, how about um, telephones? Most of the principal hotels place their telephones at the disposal of visitors. Well, isn't that nice? Hey. Uh, but in case of a private message, it may be convenient to have recourse to the public telephone boxes, which will be found at all the principal post offices, the fee being 15 centimes for each three-minute conversation. After communication established, is established. Pretty cool. Communication is also obtainable with London. The fee is 10 francs for a conversation of three minutes. So, yeah, this is fantastic. See if, feel free good, to take your time to find something interesting there. Good job with your, with your mum, as you say. My mum. You'd call it mom. Mom. Yeah. Place de la Concorde. Looking pretty similar. Yeah, we've just gone quiet, forgetting that we're on air. Yeah. Sorry. Place well, de la Concorde. What is it? Let's have a look. So that's the... Yeah, this is the Pont de la ah, Concorde. The bridge going... That's where the Hotel uh, Crillon is now. Yeah, exactly. Hotel Crillon. I went there for we a cocktail see... the other night. Oh, you did? What was really that like? Really nice. Now... Highly recommend it. For any visitors who were listening to a previous episode where I talked about Lustig, this scam artist, who yep. conned these scrap iron dealers into you know bribing and, and giving him money, it was in that, in that hotel. Like oh, that's yeah. where the scam took place. Right. A little Recently side note renovated. there. You're referring to the episode with Heidi Moore, the American. Fantastic, yeah. No, you're not. You're referring to... Which episode was that? I'm just going to say yes to whatever you say because I'm lost in this book <laughs> right now. I like it. Oh, now this, this is special. Okay, let's do it. This is special. The Paris Whisperers found something. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is exciting. You've hidden the book from me as well. This is We're exciting. sitting next yeah. to each could other you just actually, Could you leave me time? alone for a little while with okay, this book so I can just have as some As long as you share your time. thoughts out loud. Now, we've got, of course, a lot of photos here. And this is 1911, which predates the um, destruction of, I think this is one of the saddest things in the history of Paris, at Trocadero Square, mm-hmm. uh, where now people go to see the Eiffel Tower from across the river, and it's this whole big tradition. There used to be a beautiful, magnificent building at Trocadero. Oh, wow. And I'm showing Look it to that. Oliver right now. You, when you found it, you shut the book and hid it away from me. That's how excited you were. Yeah. What is that, This though? is stunning. Well, you know Hang the... Hang on, where is it? Let's get the bearings of this. Okay, this so is... This is where the Eiffel Tower... So, what Eiffel Tower, so it's been taken from the Eiffel Tower, from looking the Eiffel back. Tower, okay. looking across yeah, okay. the bridge, okay? So what happened was Trocadero nowadays is, is just a, a pale comparison of what it used to be because for these world fairs and these big sort of events, they would uh, construct things. And so it was a fair of 1937, something about industry and, and whatnot. They built this beautiful Trocadero Palace. Mm. And it's gone now. It's such a shame that it's gone. Look at that's really, it looks like a kind of circus mixed with the temple. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's such a shame that they had to tear down those. Can we describe structures. it for that? We'll take a picture, page twenty, so I remember. But this is like yeah, share a photo on the. It on looks the like blog. the Colosseum, just the Colosseum with a couple of beautiful bell towers extending up yeah, on either wow. side, and uh, and then below it we have photos of a couple of buildings that thank God are still here: the Grand Palais and the Petit Palais. Mm. Hey, what does it say about that building? About the Trocadero? Yeah, I mean, it must. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Maybe it was after. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that was starting yeah. the, the first day. Wow, they really made you work in these days. This is ridiculous. Yeah, the list of what they give you for the itineraries are just not, it's not possible. Yeah, you would literally hear so yourself. I mean, it yeah, should be so on that. Let's find Trocadero here. Place de la Concorde, Champs-Élysées. Okay. Palais of Trocadero. Uh, so erected in 1878. 1878, yeah. And then in 1937, I may have misspoke earlier, but they destroyed it, I think, uh, around that time. 
and it hasn't been there since. And a small but pleasant park lies between the Trocadero and the river. That's still kind of there. That's still there, yeah. yeah. There's a fountain. And there's the beautiful trees there. Yep. The cherry blossoms, I think they are. Maybe. Gorgeous. You know what? At, at 1911, was that when they had the human zoo? Uh, no, that was 1906. I maybe. Think. I can tell you what did happen in 1911. What? And I was keeping this for one of my Corey's stories. Uh, but why oh. don't we... like, Seeing as I'm the guest on this episode... Segway in. Ooh, let's segue. Yeah, let's do I it. like that. You, re- you really are a pro. <laughs> so let's segue, folks. I'm going to put down this book. Okay, the book's done for now. Paris. Now, when he pulled out this um, uh, guidebook from 1911, that date sort of sparked something in my mind because that was a very interesting year for the Louvre Museum. So what happened is in 1911, there was an Italian guy. And we've, we've transitioned now into Corey's stories. Yeah. yeah. Should Where's we the play the jingle? jingle? Please play the jingle. Hang on, let me just get the button. It's a Corey story. There you go. Nice. It's not official unless the jingle happens. Correct. So it's 1911. There's an Italian immigrant living in Paris, and he's done some work as a laborer and whatnot, and worked in the Louvre and things like that. And then he decides, for whatever reason, he's going to steal an object from the museum. So what he does is not that difficult. He goes in with the tourist one day into the museum and locks himself into a a utility closet in one of the galleries, and he stays there all day and all night, and then the next morning, the museum is closed to the public, Mm. just like it is now, one day a week, they close it for maintenance and cleaning, and he sneaks out into this empty gallery, grabs an object, wraps it up in fabric, puts it under his arm, and it wasn't complicated, he simply walks out, right past the guards, out of the Louvre, hops on a bus, goes to his apartment on the right bank, pops the object under the bed, he had just stolen the Mona Lisa. (laughs) <laughs> that was such a fabricated response how dare you go on can you you know the story no well you know I, the I story. Heard, heard this hey i live in I, I i you know i've been around the block you've been around this yeah. isn't my first rodeo but i want to hear your version of it yeah well so what happened he steals this thing and it was going to go missing for two years it was going to stay hidden underneath this guy's bed mm. in sort of this false bottom of a chest and so what happens when they realize that the louvre uh, that the, the painting's gone this da vinci masterpiece everyone panics the police shut down the borders of france to keep the painting from leaving they interrogate everybody in paris who might be a suspect including a spanish artist living in saint germain des prés known as pablo picasso <gasps> I thought he lived up in Montmartre. Well, he was in Montmartre probably in that time, yeah. 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 Uh, so he was in Montmartre at that time, then went to Montparnasse and saint germain Thanks for keeping me honest. <laughs> yeah, well, hey. I've done one of your tours before now, we can say, and uh, I remember you pointing out the Bateau Lavoie. Yeah, the Bateau Lavoie. Oh, man. And, another you know, story, another story. Continue. That's a, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to get sidetracked. Do one of Corey's tours. He'll show yeah, you do, himself. Do my tour. French Fry in Paris. Find me online, blog, Facebook, Instagram, and you can request a Montmartre tour. We'll go see Picasso's studio. But anyway, uh, back to the, the, the Mona Lisa. Uh, Picasso didn't do it, so they let him go. And then they interrogate the guy himself. His name is Perugia, by the way. Perugia. Know, Perugia. Perugia. Perugia, this Italian. He's sitting on his bed while the police interrogate him with the Mona Lisa hidden underneath, and he convinces the cops that he didn't take it. So how does this story end? Well, he, two years later, after everybody assumes the Mona Lisa's gone forever, he tries to cash in, and he goes down to Florence to sell this painting to an art dealer. He gets caught. The Mona Lisa makes her triumphant return back to the Louvre, and all this is interesting. All of the photographers, the journalists, they're documenting this, and everyone starts talking about it, right? And that's why, if you go into the Louvre, and you see the crowd in front of the Mona Lisa, and you ask yourself, many people do, why is it so big? Like, what's it, why is it such a rock star? As what in, why is, is it so deal? famous? It's not actually that big. It's not actually yeah. big physically. Mm. But why is it such a big deal compared to the other Da Vinci's that the Louvre owns? Mm. Well, the reason is mostly because it was stolen in 1911, the date of this book that I'm holding in my hand. Mm. And that's what made it so world-renowned. Mm. Everybody's talking about the stolen picture. And in fact, I can prove that to you. And you may want to put this on the blog so people can see this image. Always do. Uh, The Washington Post, which is an American newspaper, at this time, uh, they put a huge article in their newspaper saying, priceless painting stolen from French Museum. And the photo they put of the Mona Lisa, they screwed it up. They put the wrong painting. What did they put? They put some other random Italian painting of a lady that was not at all the Mona Lisa. Proof, in my mind, that before this theft in 1911, people around the world didn't know the Mona Lisa. It wasn't a household name. So this that's why when you go now today, you'll see it behind bulletproof glass in a little climate-controlled compartment with always at least two guards and a barrier. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's just the hype. I mean, it's a nice, mm. pi- it's a nice picture, but the whole yeah. the whole museum's full of nice pictures. Yeah, and I don't want to take anything away from Da Vinci. It's a beautiful Renaissance hey, who portrait. Who are we to take anything from Da Vinci? No, absolutely not. But there are other Da Vinci's there and other Renaissance masterpieces that deserve their due as well. But they were never stolen. So. You know what? Uh, da Vinci used to live in Amboise. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I went there. Yeah, I went there that's too. It, that's Did you go to the the chateau that he lived in? I went to that's become like a museum. Yeah, it's called the yeah. Clos Lucet. Yeah, 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 it's beautiful. It's yeah. got and in the garden, it's got some of his inventions, contraptions, it's amazing. And things. Yeah. Also, I did a Segway tour. First time on a Segway. Ah, speaking of Segways earlier. That was a segue into a segue. That was a segue into a segue. But that was pretty... I'm going to look into this book later and post it on the site if there's any mention of the lovely Mona Lisa. Mm. And it's interesting to think that back in that time, the glass pyramid that's out there wouldn't have been... uh, It It wouldn't have been there. There was no glass pyramid at all. See if we can find the Louvre. To finish up, we've got a few minutes. See what it says about the Louvre. All right. So Corey's found at page 100. Wouldn't it be great if if the first paragraph started with, oh my God, the Mona Lisa's not here. (laughs) Last year we had the Mona Lisa, but... All right, this is the Louvre General, the exterior. The main building is in the form of a square around the large Cour du Louvre. I don't think they call it that anymore. Looking upon the Rue de Rivoli to the north and the Place du Louvre and the Church of saint germain lauxerrois to the east. And they're talking about La Cour Carrée. So, uh, yeah, they're talking about the pavilions and how uh, Henry IV and Louis XIII and XIV lived there and contributed to the construction. Why are they not giving us anything about the inside? There must be. You know what's uh, weird about all this is, you know, I'm from Australia. Are you? Uh, yeah. So everything in the, there you go, the Louvre. So everything in this book, like the streets they're talking about, these are over a hundred years old. In mm. my country, the oldest thing you can find is the lady next door. So oh, <laughs> but it's <laughs> but it is a really young country. I mean, like it's, it's really there's no streets in my city that yeah. are hundred years old. You know, I meet a lot of Aussies giving my tours, and I find that they just like Americans have young country, mm. uh, like young country, and so we. Like both of our groups, both of our nationalities, I think really love Europe mm. for its for its uh, history. Fascinating. So yeah, they're talking about the picture galleries. Return along the corridor and ascend the grand staircase. At the top of this staircase stands the famous Victory of Samothrace, which is still there. Uh, one of the finest pieces of Greek sculpture in existence. And little, if at all, inferior to the Venus de Milo. Gallery of Apollo. So, yeah. so if the Mona Lisa hadn't been taken, then it would have just been another old painting in there. Well, I guess it's by da Vinci, but... Yeah, see... No mention of it. It's yeah, getting like, stolen right when this was written. I'm looking... F- I'm scanning the text here to see if they even mention... Now, Leonardo da Vinci, they mention Madonna and Infant Christ with Saint Anne. Now, keep this in mind, guys. This is before the theft of the Mona Lisa, and they are not mentioning the Mona Lisa, except far down, they say La Gioconda by Leonardo da Vinci. But it gets like fourth or fifth billing so what it hasn't been stolen then yet it hasn't been stolen so it says, near it is another really go on near it is another holy family known as the holy family of francis the first for whom it was painted by the same master and mona lisa sometimes called la gioconda by leonardo da vinci a lady whose strange sweet smile lurks in the memory of all who have seen the picture not a mention of the fascinating history that was yeah, just about it to should happen. be noted that in this paragraph describing the italian renaissance masterpieces it mentions another da vinci the madonna and infant christ and then moves on to a raphael and then gets to the mona lisa wow wait nowadays would that happen i don't think so no i think you'd start off with mona lisa as top billing i think it would probably be a picture of mona lisa on the front probably you're right could be well i hope you found that interesting Corey. i really certainly did that was a real pleasant surprise thank you another surprise that's what we do on this show it's not the first surprise we've done and it won't I'm be sure. No, I'm sure there will there will be others. So uh, yeah, you know what you've been listening to. Thanks for doing it. And which we'll tune will tune. You guys will tune in for another one hopefully soon. Subscribe, follow, like, uh, and have a good time doing it. Goodbye. Au revoir. A bientôt. Eiffel Tower with all of a G.